reminder, we're going to record. You'll have to say you got it. And um, and we'll, uh, Vicki, do you want to kick us off with a welcome? Or jump, we can jump right into the agenda too. Yeah, no, um, I have some things, but it's coming a little bit later. So okay. we can jump right into the agenda. I'm just happy to see you all. We're coming to the end. Uh, we have one more meeting next month um, as we uh, embark on a new a new adventure. I'm so excited. And I think Malia sent me a text this morning and said, do you know by the time the advisory committee is discharged in December, you will have served 45 months? Oh my God, that's like 45 months. Sounds like a jail sentence. But uh it's it has seemed like that at some points but um for the most part i think this has just been pretty darn awesome so uh we've got a big agenda today i'll come back on and go through the december land board agenda and tell you what we're going to be doing there uh, but for now i'm just going to sit back and listen and send a text message to costco and tell him to get my order here <laughs> all right um so um, for purposes of the agenda, I'm going to do a quick um, run of show here, and then um, we'll pause before we actually get to the agenda topics um, that are outlined, see if anybody has updates they'd like to share, um, things pertinent to your discussions, but maybe not on the agenda. I will note that Colin Beck um, sends his regards. He's um, in the in the field and was unable to join an out of cell phone range as well, but um, he's been closely tracking the work on the FMP and other elements of it um, and sends his regards to all of you. Um, for the agenda today, we have really like 45 minutes that we're going to focus on what has been the bulk of the work um, in you know the last I don't know, six months or more, um, really focused on the forest management plan. So obviously we can't go into the, the details of all the work that's happened. You all have, uh, as well as the public has access to the current draft. Um, welcome any feedback you have. Shannon's going to give a fairly high level overview um, of the, the FMP and the key provisions or key sections that are included in, in this version. Um, and she may sort of focus in on a couple of interesting facets there. Um, and then we'll save a little bit of time for Q&A and a discussion. We'll then have a um, fairly high level overview of the financial analysis, the validation process, and next steps. Have an opportunity for some brief questions and answers. Again, keeping it at a relatively high level here. We'll take a break. Um, around 1.30 ish. And then um, as Vicki mentioned, we'll talk about the state land board meeting that's coming up in December. So um, Vicki will give an overview of the agenda topics and the approach. Um, <clears throat> we'll talk about um, the prospective board member appointments process. We're not gonna go through sort of who potential appointees will be. Uh, we're not prepared to do that at this meeting, but we want to talk with you about the approach for addressing that during that land board meeting. And then we want to talk with you all about um, your engagement in the meeting uh, with the land board. If you have any desire to make a statement together, um, or if individuals, as in the past, would like to sort of set themselves up in, in a panel form, we have uh, a variety of ways that we can handle that if you all are interested in engaging um, with the land board directly. Uh, and then finally, um, we have a variety of uh, additional work product updates. Uh, you'll see quite a list here. We probably we don't have time to get into uh, details on these, but feels important and felt important to just give you all a sense of all the different work uh, that's happening with regards to moving this research forest effort forward. And so the list includes um, you know, carbon, the startup costs, the appraisal, East Hackey Ridge, the HCP, um, the Habitat Conservation Plan, contract terms, shutter creep. Um, and then importantly, we want to uh, end on this note of public engagement because two days from now, there's a public uh, information session that's jointly being hosted by OSU and DSL. Uh, and uh, we'll transition at that point to public comment. Um, 
that probably is in the window of around 245, but it'll depend on where we're at. We'll make sure we have 10 minutes at least reserved for public comment. If you're interested in making um, public uh, comments, if you're a member of the public and interested in um, addressing the committee, we'd welcome that. Please just send Jenna or I a chat and we'll make sure to get you in the queue and we'll wrap up and get you out of here no later than three o'clock. Any questions about the agenda? All right, three o'clock's ambitious. It's a lot to cover. Um, so with that, any general updates from the committee members um, that you'd like to share with each other? Things that are not on the agenda per se, but just relevant to your work. All right. As a reminder, Shannon, as you get queued up for the FMP, as a reminder for members of the public, um, the conversation during these advisory committee me uh, meetings is reserved for committee members. Um, and we'd encourage you to chat directly with Jenna or I if you need to get in the queue and, and, and address folks. But um, we'll reserve the conversation for committee members and look for more opportunity later in the week to, to talk um, at length with folks. So, Shannon, I turn it over to you. Okay, thanks so much, Peter. Um, and thank you everyone for joining today. It's good to see you all. Um, is that showing correctly? Okay, great. So um, today we've got, as Peter mentioned, um, about 45 minutes scheduled to specifically talk about the forest management plan draft. Um, and so I wanted to give um, an overview of progress, how all of these pieces are coming together, and then uh, the key sections that are in that draft that was shared ahead of this meeting um, with a, a couple of sort of more detailed examples, but really wanted to um, reserve uh, a good amount of time during this window that we have um, for discussion and questions. Um, so as I said, ahead of this meeting, the OSU team shared a working draft of the FMP with a focus on the priority sections that were discussed and determined with this committee. Um, and as we've also discussed previously, there are multiple workflows happening um, that go into developing um, the forest management plan and, uh, and planning efforts uh, on a, on a comprehensive level that have been happening. So some of these main workflows are outlined here. Um, and it's really focused on building knowledge about the Elliott in the context of forest management planning and forest ecosystem research. Um, and so this has been a huge group effort. More than 50 people have contributed um, so far to the planning process through collecting and analyzing data, including as part of the 2022 um, field season and pilot studies that have been happening this year, um, as well as contributing input and draft text on sections um, of, the, of the FMP draft, a lot of that happening through technical groups um, that have been meeting uh, over the course of the past year, um, participating in site visits. We've had uh, people reviewing information in the draft and contributing to analysis um, and modeling. Um, and as I said, that input uh, includes uh, members of the advisory committee and the FMP working group through these technical groups. Um, it also has included working with consulting foresters, researchers, local community members and organizations and other experts. This is an ongoing piece of forest management planning, but it's been really important to get us to where we are um, with the draft that was shared. Um, those uh, site visits have been uh, targeted to um, support collaboration, content development going into the draft, and ground truthing information that we're receiving. This is another ongoing process, um, as well as that landscape analysis and modeling. And so all of this has, has contributed to the draft at this stage, again, with that focus on the priority sections. Um, new findings have come from the data that has been collected and the analyses that are ongoing. And so that's been um, a really um, exciting part of this process. So just to give um, sort of a couple of examples and updates from some of the things that we talked about at the September meeting, um, we had a biodiversity pilot study that happened uh, this past summer with 56 sites surveyed between June and September 2022. So um, that pilot season um, has now completed and analysis is underway on, on the samples um, that were collected. 
Uh, this work um, and the design were informed by a recent study at the H.J. Andrews and the Willamette National Forest um, and uh, was done in collaboration with authors um, on that study. And there is a, a report um, outlining the methodology used, um, how that information was um, was used in, in developing um, the design and layout for the pilot that happened on the Elliott this summer. And so that report is included as an appendix in the FMP draft uh, that was shared. The connections here, some of the main connections are contributing to development of the monitoring methods that are outlined in chapter 10 of the draft. Um, as well as piloting methodology for a permanent biodiversity plot network that's um, described in that chapter and beginning to build a biodiversity uh, database for the Elliott. So this is a map of the 56 um, sites this summer uh, that were part of this pilot study. These are organized around uh, early implementation uh, sub watersheds that were identified by one of the technical groups. Um, for the phased implementation part of the triad experiment, um, as well as uh, Northern Spotted Owl Monitoring Project that's being run by the U.S. Forest Service. So you can see here um, the biodiversity sites are um, across the forest in the MRW um, and are also across a gradient of stand ages. There's also additional work on canopy surveys happening this fall, and that's um, getting close to being wrapped up here this month. Another component of the field season uh, that is, uh, that's contributed to the draft at this stage um, is looking at disturbance history and stand history. And so there have been some really interesting um, early results of that analysis um, that we're starting to get in and that analysis is going to be completed um, over this winter. Um, but really what this group found, and this is a, um, being led by Andrew Marshall, um, is that the Elliott, as we know, is composed of even-aged and multi-aged stands, um, and the disturbance history is, is really closely tied to um, the stand structures that we're seeing and these tree cohorts. Um, and they've established after multiple disturbances, including multiple fires in the 1800s. Um, we've talked a lot about the 1868 fire. Uh, the work that was done this summer is finding evidence of um, important fires for understanding um, the distribution of these um, stands and cohorts um, from not only 1868, but also uh, 1822, 1849, 1883, and 1892. And some sites, some data that has been collected uh, goes back to fires as far as the 1600s and 1700s. So we're getting a really um, interesting snapshot of the disturbance history on the Elliott, as well as the surrounding region, um, looking at detecting how these patterns of high, moderate, and low severity fires and reburns um, contribute to what we're seeing on the landscape now and give us uh, a greater sense of what this history has been, which is really important for what we're doing now with management planning, um, as well as looking forward to um, future research on the forest and looking at things like um, impacts of climate change and adaptive civil culture. So really understanding the full range of disturbance history for the Elliott and the Oregon Coast Range. Hey, Shannon, this is Keith and I'm just satisfying the nerd in me. Can you run through the years of those fires again? Sure, so the, the, um, the major fires that they've detected so far are 1822, 1849, 1868, 1883 and 1892. Thank you very much. No problem. Um, and so all of this is really contributing to understanding the role, uh, as I said, of reburns, of spatial variation on the forest and the complexity of the fire history in creating uh, the forest that we're seeing today. This also um, has connections to what we're developing for the draft. So you'll notice in the background section, an area that's not a priority section, but is being co-developed alongside of those priority sections um, there is a, a, a draft on uh, the role of fire and disturbance history, um, and that will be continuing to be added to as this analysis is completed. Um, and and another, uh, another key area is also tying this disturbance and stand history to what we're seeing with biodiversity um, and looking at what we can understand about 
the impacts of natural disturbances and, uh, and management. And so another pilot study that we're working on, um, not just on the Elliott, but um, looking at some other nearby known uh, marble murrelet nest sites is looking at stand age diversity, historic disturbance patterns. Um, and that pilot study is, is um, working under the goal of understanding patterns and conditions that create suitable habitat for marbled murrelet um, nests at the stand level so that these conditions can be replicated in restoration efforts. So all of these pieces are really coming together um, in the management planning efforts and in understanding um, more detail about the habitats, the stand structures, and the history of the forest. Um, there's also a note here um, for anyone who, who wants to get um, sort of a deeper understanding of what Andrew Marshall is working on. He recently did a pres presentation for the Midcoast Watershed Council called 500 Years of Fire on the Oregon Coast. And there's a recording up on uh, YouTube and maybe uh, one of the OSU team members could put that in the chat if anyone is interested in learning more. We can also include it in the meeting summary. That would be great. So this also connects not just to, um, to the surveys the, and the, uh, the field season that, that happened uh, this past summer, but also to just generally understanding more of the stand history, um, including getting out and doing some site visits, um, particularly in areas that we want to um, take a closer look and ground truth what we're seeing in the data. And so alongside those field surveys, LIDAR analysis, modeling, um, an important component has been getting out on the woods. And um, this is an example of understanding more about the management history and, and how that's contributing to the structures that we're seeing um, across the forest. So this is an example of a type of stand that um, based on what we're seeing on the ground um, would have developed after a single, single disturbance single disturbance. And so this is an example from Luder Creek, which is in the conservation research watershed. So part of that reserve network. Um, and you can see here the density of trees, um, lack, of, uh, lack of larger limbs, um, and just the, the general structure of this stand versus um, another example looking at uh, a stand that involved after multiple disturbances in Upper Elk Creek. And so here, um, there are a couple of, there's sort of a, a wider view and then a couple of close-ups of some of the things that we were seeing in this stand, um, looking at large tree sizes, um, complex structure, multiple species. Um, this was a stand that had uh, prior management. We found stumps, uh, gaps that were opened um, in this stand that allowed enough light for species like alder to grow in. And now that the canopy is starting to close, that alder is, is dying back. So we're seeing um, you know, the, the dynamics that are happening over a, a long, uh, longer time horizon uh, with, these, with these past management um, scenarios. As I said, stumps, um, you know, large, large limbs um, that have developed because of this disturbance in management history. Um, and so this not only gives us important information about past management and helps us fill in some of the knowledge gaps that we have, um, it also encompasses the types of forest conditions that extensive silviculture and restoration treatments uh, may emulate. And so there are, um, in the FMP draft, there's a section on extensive silviculture, which I'll talk more about in a little bit, um, as well as the restoration treatments um, and in particular, restoration treatments in reserve, um, looking at, tr at um, transitioning current dense Douglas fir plantations to some of these more um, complex structures and looking at different uh, species mixtures. So this is a sort of a helpful view to look at not only understanding past management, but also um, where we can go with future, um, future stand conditions under the research program. Hey, Shannon, it looks like Paul had a question there or a comment. Yeah. Go ahead, Paul. There, I had to get myself unmuted. <clears throat> um, yeah, you said you did you did field trips out there this last year. Did did any of the advisory committees um, get to go on these? Um, 
We, so we had, um, we had planned an advice or an FMP working group field trip in June um, that had to be um, unfortunately postponed uh, because of COVID impacts. Um, these site visits were with the technical groups um, and, and members of the core team. And so as we continue in the management planning process, we're looking at continuing to get out there more on the forest, um, including opportunities for um, interacting with others that we haven't had a chance just because of scheduling to get out there with yet. Okay. I, I sense in the question the desire to get out there, Paul. I think that that came through. And that's definitely something that we can continue to work on. You know, I have a, a, more of those. a reoccurring theme in that in that OSU is making decisions without without input. I mean, we can we can all sit on Zoom and and you can report back to us, but um, it would have been. It would have been nice to to give input and 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 be educated so we can be more intelligent when we when we sit in these meetings. Um, I I really worry about the the vacuum that these decisions are being made in. Um, you're you're picking directions with without collaboration from the committee, and and there's nothing like getting out in the woods um, to really to really bring it home, to, to really see what, what it is, you know, you're talking about. And I, um, yeah, we all couldn't make that one date, but some of us could have made other dates, you know, one or two of us and, and one or two of us is better than none. So I, I would really encourage you to include the group. Yep, com completely agree um, that really getting out getting out in the forest is the best way to talk through some of these things. Um, so we will continue continue to work on scheduling um, more opportunities for that beyond the technical group um, visits that have happened. And really a lot of um, the groundwork that happened with the couple of visits that we did this summer was scouting out these areas so that we could, um, you know, get a sense of the variation across the forest and, and target where we need to have further discussions. So um, I, I, we can we can plan on doing more of these and in um, specifically working with um, members of the advisory committee and the FMP working group to make sure that you're included in those if you're not being included in those those other ways with the technical groups. Thanks, Shannon. Yeah, thanks for that feedback. Okay, um, just a, um, a quick look here at um, another um, big document that was shared, which is a, a supplemental document looking at um, stand level allocation adjustments. Um, this is something that we discussed very briefly at the end of the September advisory committee meeting, and it's something that we've been working with the um, FMP working group on. We did um, a subset of Stand, uh, proposed stand level allocation adjustments um, in the MRW uh, at, in the summer and worked with the FMP working group on that, um, on, on reviewing those and looking at um, input on the criterion process that we were using. Um, and that was what we also shared at a very high level during the September advisory committee meeting. Um, we also then after that point moved on to finishing um, these proposed allocation adjustments on the rest of the MRW sub watersheds. And so that's the document um, that you all received that was shared ahead of this meeting that combines um, all of those sub watersheds that have been discussed with the FMP working group um, and shared over the course of the past couple of months. So um, I don't wanna spend too much time on this, but just a quick reminder of some of the criteria that we were looking at um, with those adjustments, looking at integrity of the research design, including silvicultural suitability, looking at our starting conditions, um, and uh, whether um, the outcomes that are proposed are feasible and making adjustments where needed, looking at operational and economic feasibility, um, as well as looking at um, northern spotted owl marbled mirrorlet habitat and how those overlay, um, looking at stakeholder concerns we've received, particularly in the areas around um, protections for older trees, um, marbled mirrorlet and spotted owl habitat, scenic values, and recreation. 
We also um, took a look at uh, another look at headwalls and steep slopes um, and uh, worked to make sure that there were protections in place um, within the research design um, at, at this higher level um, where you have the steeper slopes. And so in that document that was, sh that was shared, you'll notice that there is um, a slide for each of the sub watersheds that has a screen of 80% uh, and greater to try to um, target the steepest of the steep slopes. And then uh, looking at fragmentation and connectivity and any areas where we might be able to reduce fragmentation within a sub watershed and also between sub watersheds. So this is just one example um, of, of um, a slide that's in that packet looking at the before. So this was during the research proposal um, and then the after which includes in, in highlighted in this turquoise color, all the stands um, that were adjusted with a description in there of what those adjustments consisted of. So this information is being used in the planning process for landscape analyses, updated financial modeling, um, and a harvest scenario planning going forward. So all of these pieces um, have been uh, happening alongside each other um, and supporting the development of different sections of the forest management plan. So the draft that was shared ahead of this meeting um, does focus on these priority sections. As I said, it also includes some information that um, was not part of the priority section specifically, um, but was part of the co-development process for some of those sections. And so um, in chapter one, uh, priority was looking at um, FNP purpose and objectives. In chapter three, managing a research forest for multiple values, um, the sections that we were keying in here for this version of the draft are um, the recreation and public access framework and process, as well as education and outreach framework and process. And again, as we've discussed, these are um, linked to separate plans that will be developed, one for recreation and access and one for education, but this outlines um, the proposed process and, uh, and some of the considerations for how those plans uh, would be developed and how they connect with the, um, the research and management goals of the forest. Chapter four um, looks at the research platform and experimental design, um, specifically describing the triad experimental design, phased implementation, and, uh, and plans for early implementation. And so there was that technical group um, that, um, that met to um, develop a criteria and process for identifying those early implementation sub-watersheds. Um, and you'll notice in the draft that there's a note that there are 17 sub watersheds. We're going to be um, working with that group to get that list down to the 16 sub watersheds that were identified as part of the research proposal. And that next stage involves a lot of the data um, that I just discussed to be able to help inform some of those decisions. Chapter six is a focus on silviculture and harvest systems. So there's a draft on intensive silviculture, extensive silviculture, goals, objectives, and management directions. Um, there is the restoration experiment for plantations in reserve and earlier iterations of that draft have also been shared. So um, the draft that's in the current um, FMP has, um, has edits and updates um, that are incorporated from further review, as well as input that we've received from members of the advisory committee and the public, um, as well as post-disturbance response and how that differs from the CRW versus the MRW. Chapter seven is aquatic and riparian systems. Um, and so this outlines the aquatic and riparian conservation and management strategy. There's a specific section on the riparian restoration treatment experiment, um, including links for um, how that would be monitored um, and how that would um, scale over time, as well as um, looking at um, the, the plans right now for steep slopes and how that fits with, um, with OFPA and the HCP. Chapter eight looks at climate change, adaptive silviculture and forest carbon, um, in particular looking at um, opportunities for how to address adaptive silviculture for climate change under the research design. And it outlines um, resources and partners that are, um, that are working on similar projects um, here in the Northwest as well as um, in North America. 
Chapter nine looks at species conservation. Um, there's a, a strong link in this section, uh, as well as others to the Habitat Conservation Plan, but this is where there's more information on the three covered species under the HCP, um, as well as multi-species conservation with a larger um, strategy, as well as um, focusing on species of concern and species of special interest. There's also in here, um, the outline of the marbled murrelet experimental design. Chapter 10 is the monitoring chapter, um, which we'll talk about um, a little bit more in a minute. And then chapter 11 is adaptive research strategy and implementation. So you'll notice that the chapters that were included um, in this draft are again, really focused around those priority sections that we discussed. There are placeholders for the other chapters um, which will be developed in this next stage alongside um, updates and edits to the existing chapters. Wanted to take um, just a couple minutes and do a closer look at two of these sections. Um, one is the extensive research treatment section in chapter six, um, which starts with a framework looking at goals, objectives, and management guidance. This is a piece of this section that has been shared and reviewed with the advisory committee and the FMP working group already. Um, and there are members of, of this committee that are involved with that technical group that's continuing to develop that section. Um, and so that lays out the goals. Um, this, this update in this draft also includes a description of initial harvest treatment types, looking at variable uh, retention, sorry, um, lost my face, place there, uh, variable retention harvest and variable density thinnings, um, as well as a matrix and decision-making um, tree for looking at criteria for how um, stand level treatments would be assigned and guidelines for developing specific harvest treatments within that framework. Um, and so this is site specific and connected to the adaptive research strategy in chapter 11. And that's why um, these pieces are, are identified as initial, um, initial treatment types and initial guidelines. And so this is just an example. I won't dig into the, the details of this here of what these criteria look like. Um, and so this one looks at um, spatial pattern of retention for regeneration harvest. So regardless of the retention level under extensive, this gives guidance for um, how you would uh, how you would determine where aggregated attention retention is within these treatments. So looking at the importance of sensitive ecological features, there's a list here um, that would need to be um, reviewed as part of um, planning efforts, as well as cultural and archeological sites that may be on the forest in these areas um, and needing to work with, uh, with the appropriate partners on making sure that um, any harvest designs or treatment designs protect those areas. Um, as well as looking at um, operational considerations um, for how you would um, how you would conduct harvest and um, and aggregate retention of trees within those stands. Um, another section that I wanted to uh, to key in on very briefly is um, chapter ten, which is the monitoring chapter, which has connections to all of these other sections, and so this lays out. Um, a plan for, and a framework for forest inventory and carbon plots um, across the forest. And as we've discussed before, um, some of these are also aligned with biodiversity plots. There is um, a monitoring framework for aquatic and riparian systems that the riparian restoration um, experiment and some in-stream uh, projects that are mentioned in chapter seven fit within. There's a section on climate and microclimate, including climate stations, um, but also transects across the forest. Um, there are uh, monitoring plans for looking at forest management and economics, as well as um, human values for the forest, um, use uh, of the forest and environmental impact. And then again, biodiversity, um, which connects back to that pilot study that we talked about at the beginning. And so looking ahead, um, the FMP draft alongside the HCP and the research proposal lay the foundation for the management of the forest. Um, and up to this point, the work that has been happening has already started to generate interest in research collaborations, um, both here in the US and internationally. Um, and so 
you know, some of these researchers and opportunities that are already starting to rise up um, include potential collaborations um, with people in the UK, Canada, and Australia, um, as well as interest from uh, researchers in South Korea at the National Institute of Forest Science who are looking to, um, to establish their own research forest and um, are looking to the Elliot as an example of how that could be done. Um, and so they, um, they have spoken with us about the Elliot as well as um, up in Washington with the Olympic Experimental State Forest. We've had successful competitive funding, um, including um, an AFRI grant that's funding um, continued biodiversity monitoring that will build on the pilot study that was completed this past summer, um, as well as an economic, an economic development, um, an EDA smart forestry uh, grant. Uh, this is a $41 million grant um, that looks very broadly at um, investing in Oregon's forests, mass timber, and sustainable uh, built environment. Um, a piece of that grant is to look at developing 3D visualization tools for forest planning. And so researchers are building this tool using LIDAR from the Elliott and bringing new technology not only to the Elliott, but the region. Um, and so we're working with them on that um, and, and anticipating that they'll, they'll be able to share that tool with us as it's developed for application on the Elliott. So those are just an example of already some of uh, the successful, um, successful uh, funding and, and uh, competitive research grants that have come in, um, as well as proposals that are in process. So this is sort of the tip of the iceberg for opportunities that are already coming in based on the work that, that this group has done so far. And so next steps, um, we are right now looking at the November 2022 draft with priority sections. Um, we have been uh, getting comments from advisory committee, um, FMP working group, as well as um, the public. And so we've been tracking those comments. We're addressing feedback um, as edits and updates are made to the drafts. So just really wanted to thank everyone um, who has taken the time to, to send in uh, to send in comments and questions, not only written, but also through the listening sessions we've been having. Um, looking forward, we're um, going to be continuing to update um, drafts and working on development of additional sections that were not part of the specific goal for this phase in the process, um, as well as continued alignment with the HCP and incorporating the outcomes of the analyses that have been happening. So with that, I will um, turn it back over to Peter. Yeah, and the group. And the Maybe group. you can, um, yeah, we'll see if there are comments and questions from the committee. <clears throat> and I think you can probably stop sharing. Yeah, that way we can see each other. Any comments or questions from the advisory committee? Keith, it looked like you were chiming in there. Oh, maybe not. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I was, I apologize. Uh, hey, Shannon, I, I was just interested in the, uh, the, the collaborative efforts or reach outs uh, from, from, from other places, universities, nations, uh, and, and where, where they became familiar with, with the ongoing efforts on the, on the Elliott. Was that in professional journals or uh, so I, that's, that's my question. Just where did they find out about the Elliott and um, what is when, and in your professional opinion, what is the opportunity or the chance that we're that you'll see those collaborative efforts with, with uh, out of country universities? Yeah. So um, the the interest has come from a, a lot of different angles, and um, Katie might also be able to speak more to this too. Um, there was a news article in Nature that um, that I think um, a lot of people saw, and that's one of the the ways that the forest scientists from uh, South Korea became familiar with the Elliot and, and reached out and wanted to talk more. Um, there have also been articles published already about the triad design, um, you know, uh, by others long before long before the Elliot, but also by members of, of the team that have been working on the research proposal and the forest management plan. Um, as well as um, just collaborating and, and um, meeting with people through um, through professional meetings and conferences, um, and so a lot of a lot of um, the inquiries that we've been getting um, 
have really come about through conversations that researchers are, are having with each other and some of the things that have been published already about the Elliott and, and the work that this group is doing. Thank you. Um, there Maybe. was one other two that um, still chainsaws um, has their national headquarters in Stuttgart, Germany, and they just built a new national headquarters. And through discussions with Matt Betts learned about the Elliott and the H.J. Andrews and some other research. And so they actually sent a film crew from um, Germany over here and they spent a day on the Elliott filming. And um, it's now going to be shown at the Stuttgart headquarters of Still Chainsaws. They have a, a exhibition as you go in there. In the, so it'll be there alongside of many other places from Thailand and Sweden. And so it's a truly, it was a unique experience and it was great to see them on the forest that day. Well, yeah. clearly that, that demands a field trip to Stuttgart, don't you think? Yeah, yeah definitely. Oh, well, I didn't thought about that. What a great idea. <laughs> Good, thanks. And Ken and Paul, I see you, but before we do that, Tom. Uh, I was just gonna chime in that as, as uh, Shannon said, that Nature article kicked off a bunch of interest, including uh, people from universities in Austria and Germany. Uh, one of those groups invited us to present on the Elliott at a uh, conference on sustainable forestry in Europe, and uh, Matt made that presentation. And I think he reached a large audience uh, with that presentation. Uh, and uh, but I think a lot of interest internationally came out of that article that basically said this is a, a really interesting uh, opportunity that exists. There's still big hurdles to cross to to actually uh, make this happen, but that it was really looked at upon by you know the one of the premier science journals in the world, Nature and Science being those two, uh, to highlight this forest is such a unique exercise in, you know, a combination of governance and uh, community or, or society input and, uh, and, you know, desire to initiate research at a, at a scale like this. And I, I just want to emphasize that it's this doesn't happen any you know around the world that the that a state within a nation invests this kind of funding in research in the long term health of their forests and their forest products industry as as well as the you know health of the species that inhabit these forests and and that is gathering attention from all over the world. And um, I just, <laughs> that nature article was just one of the first things to kick it off. There'll be a lot more interest as uh, things develop, assuming that we're able to get across those remaining hurdles. Thanks, Tom. And if you didn't catch it, there is, um, Jen posted a, a link to the nature article. Um, so uh, Ken, Paul, and then Mark. Well, hey, it's just absolutely great to see this group has gone global already, oh, kind of kind of early and, and yet kind of a little bit late too. Um, I think you know things that have been going on here are, are definitely worth some world look. So it, that's really cool. But my real comment was um, a thanks to Shannon and company for um, a little more detail and, and making it really clear how the access, recreation, and education. Um, pieces will be developed as, as we move along, but also uh, kind of explaining to our publics that, uh, that we definitely have an interest in, in those pieces. And I was really happy to see, I was unable to make the, uh, the trip over to the coast when, we, when you guys talked with Southwest Oregon Community College and others there in, in the Bay Area. Um, sorry, I missed that, but hey, camping is, is what I like in the summer times. So. Um, at any rate, thank you, Shannon, for kind of clarifying some of that and, uh, and laying it out for the public. Thanks, Ken. Thank you, Ken, for your, your comments um, throughout that process. Um, they, they've really helped to strengthen the, the draft. Good. Paul? 
I just the the, the, merc, the mercenary in me has got to ask: is the is the interest in using the Elliot um, for a lab, or is or is the interest in using the Elliot and what we're doing as a funding source for people in Austria and South Korea? Um, are would these folks be bringing bringing money um, to do their research? Yeah, that's a really, really important point, Paul. So the, what is laid out here in the forest management plan and in the funding for the forest is funding the, the, the baseline of the program. So the management um, under the under the treatments um, in, in, the, in chapter six in the harvest and silviculture systems um, and what's outlined in the research proposal, as well as the monitoring, that's part of the backbone of the forest that's outlined in chapter 10. The additional work that would come from researchers, um, you know, partnering on the Elliott, wanting to come and collaborate on research, um, similarly to what they do in other forests like the H.J. Andrews, that would come about through um, additional um, possibly nested experiments or working within the framework that we've set up, but it does involve them bringing funds to support their own research. And so the vision is not that the Elliott um, would be able to support, um, you know, um, un unending research. We're focusing on the core plan and the fact that there, um, there would be this long-term research forest infrastructure with a clear management plan with, um, with a monitoring uh, framework that covers the whole forest in this detail, that's really exciting for a lot of people. It allows them to write grants and go after funding and bring that funding to the forest to support their own work. So it kind of all builds on each other. Thanks, Shannon. Paul, did that answer your question? Good. Mark? Yeah, thanks, Peter. And. Uh... Thanks, Shannon, for bringing this together. I can tell there's been a lot of work on it done, and you've already obviously been pulling together a lot of information. I can imagine the challenge with the, all the cooks in the kitchen and uh, a variety of recipes that you're trying to sort of bring into one, one vision and one document, if you will. I had some specific comments, but maybe just a couple, two general ones is that, um, you know, chapter two is about the governance there, and that's sort of a a work in progress. I think a lot of that is spelled out in the state legislation, but, you know, as I sort of look at it from a due diligence standpoint, as we go towards the home stretch here, it'd be really nice to see what that is and have it laid out there. I think a lot of it is to some extent scripted already, but I think it's really an important piece of the document and of the project at large. So from my perspective, that would be one that would be really important to have laid out uh, before the land board meeting coming up. And then another topic that I, I think could be helpful to have a little more information is relates to chapter 1.7 on cultural resources, and it comes up in some of the other chapters as well. And, you know, I, I'm sure, you know, your intent is to work with the tribes to help, you know, articulate what that is. But again, I think it's a really important piece of the project. And it'd be nice to have um, some understanding of what those expectations are, um, recognizing that they'll evolve and change as other things will in the document, but to at least have a base point so that we all had the same, same grounding on it as we went forward. So those are the two of the larger pieces in terms of sections yet to be developed that I could see being really important to try and put some language on the bones there. Yeah, thank you for the, those comments, Mark. Um, I think you're right about chapter two, the governance chapter. Um, the, the foundation of that really has been laid by um, the Senate bill 1546 um, and there is a currently a placeholder there because that wasn't one of the priority sections that um, that we talked about with this group as as really needing to target for for this December. Not because it's not important um, and really critical to the functioning of the forest, um, but because we have that foundation with the Senate bill. Um, but we also need to work with um, 
you know, OSU and DSL and members of this committee to really flesh out within the management plan um, what that looks like. And so wanting to take the time to do that with the Senate bill um, and the language in there as the foundation, that, that was sort of the thinking behind that chapter. Um, and that's something that we can we can make clear um, and is is an important part of the next step on the on the FMP. Um, similarly with cultural resources, um, and I know you had given us some feedback about um, traditional ecological knowledge as well and how that's addressed in the forest management plan. And it's mentioned specifically in a couple of sections, um, you know, working with working with tribes, um, understanding what traditional and contemporary ecological knowledge is and how that fits in with the research and education mission. Um, that is also part of a, um, a, a broader um, sort of um, overlay of the forest management plan and part of a, a bigger process that's been happening. And so um, those conversations um, have been happening um, at the College of Forestry level with how with um, with specific tribes about how we develop those relationships and partnerships, um, as well as um, the, one of our next steps is continuing to work with um, Christina Eisenberg um, here at the college, who is a new um, associate dean. Um, and and one of her big roles is looking at tribal engagement, um, as well as members of this advisory committee. Um, so a lot of that groundwork has been laid. Um, because that wasn't a priority section and because it's so important that we make sure that that, that process, um, that we give it time to be able to have conversations um, with the people who need to be involved in that decision making. That's why we didn't put out any, any draft language in this form yet, but all of those conversations are happening and, and um, will be coming in a future version of the draft. Um, and is something that we want to be able to share and discuss with um, with members of the committee who may be interested in continuing the conversation with us. Okay, thanks for that perspective there. Now, one other specific question, I don't know if you can answer it, but I sort of caught my attention under 1.8 easements for legal access. I just wondered, you know, are there any major uh, access eas easement accesses across the forest or in particular, are there any that demand access through the conservation uh, research watershed? Um, there are some easements on the forest, and uh, you know, part of for access, um, part of that um, is outlined in uh, in previous documents. So we have the 2011 forest management plan from ODF to draw upon, um, but we also have more current information. Um, we've gotten. Um, We've gotten some input from from people through our process of accepting uh, or asking for written comments as well as the listening session. Um, people saying, you know, I there's this um, access um, point that that is really important to be able to be cons um, you know conserved or preserved in in the forest management plan. So that's another piece that again wasn't a priority section, um, but it's something that um, will be included in the updated. Um, section. There are a couple of in-holdings as well within the Elliott. Great, thanks. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks, Mark. Um, Vicki, and then Paul, and then I'm going to try to move us <clears throat> to the next topic. Um, okay, great. Those were all great questions, Mark. Um, and I, I want to follow up on what Shannon said. First of all, I want to say that this is an incredibly awesome piece of work. Tom, your team has done a great job. The advisory committee members that have been involved in the subcommittees, the um, public that is engaged, this is incredible. Um, I'm really, really impressed. Um, so let me let me comment on a couple things that um, Mark raised. The, um, the issue about the governance that we're not done with that conversation. That's a conversation that's going to continue at length into 2023. Um, and it will come up as we talk about who's going to be serving on the, on the authority, but mostly Mark, that conversation got set aside um, until we got the most important parts done and we can 
deal with this at a, at a later point. And I agree with Shannon about the cultural resources. These The conversations with the tribes are not quick conversations. They should never be quick conversations. They need to be um, in-depth um, government to government consultations with the tribes to talk more about the cultural resources. I think we laid the minimal groundwork for that in the Senate bill, um, but there's a lot of um, continued interaction with the tribes that needs to take place and we're all committed to doing that. Um, I also wanted to um, uh, thank the members of the public for being very involved. Um, this is exciting to see all of these international folks that are interested in what we're doing on the Elliott is tremendous. This is this is what we'd all hope for. Um, so I just think you all ought to take a bow and um, clap yourselves on the back for this work. Uh, I am just, I'm sitting here in California where there aren't a lot of trees where I'm at, palm trees. <laughs> It's nothing like the Elliot, and uh, what we have is a gem in Oregon, and I just really want to thank you for the work. Uh, I'm just stunned, and so are the cats in the background who are napping. Um, my daughter has four cats, so uh, they're all around the house here. But anyway, they're listening, and they too believe this is great. Um, so thank you. I think we do also have to do. Uh, a little bit more work on the recreation side. Um, that's going to come uh, as we move forward. And then in terms of talking about the easements, there are a number of easements in the Elliott. Um, David Gould reached out to us recently. Um, his family has an easement and Ryan Singleton tracked that down for him and it doesn't expire for quite some time. So uh, we can get you a list of easements if anyone's interested in that, um, because those have all come through the Department of State lands, unless um, even if they're on um, ODF land, we should have um, access to those easements if you want to see those. Thanks, Vicki. That's it. Um, good, Paul. And then Shannon, uh, Paul, then Bob, and then Shannon, and then I am going to try to move us to the next topic. Well, All right. My, mine's really quick, Peter. Um, no it, it's, it's not an easement issue, but it's, a, it's an access issue. And a number, the number one access issue that I see, and specific to the, to the reserve area on the west, is, is access for the rest of the Elliott that we are going to manage. So whatever we do in that reserve area, we need to preserve access um to to get to get out to get through um most of your markets are going to be that direction and so anything that we do we need to bear that in mind that 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 access is absolutely critical thanks paul and i see shannon uh and katie and others acknowledging that Uh, Bob. Yeah, no, thank you for the uh, presentation. There, there's a lot in there. I, I just want to flag, and I don't want to go into the details today, but there, you know, we talked about as we head to the land board meeting and as the HCP gets released uh, in the coming days, uh, there were a number of outstanding issues, things like roads and uh, some other things as well uh, that we were going to try and wrap up and get onto some sort of a rata sheet so that we could say to the public, you know, these things were outstanding issues that are resolved as opposed to uh, having people mobilize around them. Uh, there's still a bunch of them that are out there. Um, some of them are relatively minor, some of them are not, but I, I want to make sure that we keep the pedal to the metal uh, because we do have um, comment periods coming up in, in both cases. And uh, I think some of them are, are a matter of making the call. Uh, some of them just seem to, we just don't seem to be able to just lay it down and say, this is this is what it's going to be. And now folks can either agree with it or challenge it if they want to. Uh, but the more we clean those things up, the smoother this end game process for this year is going to be. Thanks, Bob. I, I was going to note the same, that 
there is, you know, Vicky, I think you did a nice job of saying thank you. And, and it is a tremendous amount of work to get to this point. And, you know, I think we also need to be clear eyed about the, the fact that there are still a few remaining. There is, in addition to the placeholder sections, there are a few remaining issues that need to be worked through, um, hopefully in the coming weeks. Um, and, you know, everybody is going to be, you know, nose to the to the grindstone, so to speak, here for the for the next couple of weeks to try to get that pulled together. So everybody should be aware that that work is happening. Um, and, and and there's going to be listening sessions with the public and input and your your comments, the public's comments will still be reflected in the next iteration of the FMP that would be the one that will be submitted to the land board for their December meeting. Um, so that work is ongoing. Um, Shannon, anything else before we transition to the next topic? Um, I, I just wanted to also acknowledge um, what Bob said about the additional pieces that we've been continuing to work through. Um, and so, you know, again, and, and also following on what you were saying, Peter, um, that that we're continuing to to work through those those areas as well as um, as well as what's gone into the draft already. Um, and I also just wanted to thank this committee um, and everyone who's been involved in the process to this point um, and, and really contributing to the draft, um, whether it is through um, the advisory committee as a whole, um, the FMP working group or technical groups. Um, we just really appreciate um, all of the work that you've done um, a, as a group with OSU, um, with DSL and with um, other um, other partners who have been working with us on this project. So um, thank you. It's really been invaluable. Thanks, Shannon. Um, Keith? Yeah, I, I'm glad somebody mentioned it. I think Peter you, or Shannon, maybe you just mentioned it, the things to do. I, I know you heard, I heard that. And then you were talking about the, the land board meeting in December. And I was going to do it later, but I'll throw it out now and uh, suggest that once again, the advisory committee does a joint letter to the land board in terms of the work we've done and the uh, and the position we we unanimously take or the position we take about continuing with the work and with uh, with with the formation of a of a management committee and uh, I, th I I think it makes sense I, I really like it when we reach out to to the land board I I absolutely believe that it is. Uh, great for this process. Uh, and I've heard that from them. And uh, I, so I, I'll throw that out if we have a few minutes for, for discussion, but I'd, I'd suggest we reach out again in a joint letter to the land board. Any, I'll, I'll pause there for a second to see if there are any reactions from the committee to that. And if not, we can revisit it again when we come to the sort of prep for that meeting. Anybody? Want to react to it from the committee? Um, I would say the land board always appreciates that. Um, every time that you have done that, they have listened. Um, so I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think that you would be opposed to doing that, and I would encourage you to do that, as well as um, I really want you all to be present. Um, I think that's going to be important. And someone asked in the chat when the meeting is, it's December 13th. And we have moved the meeting to 9 a.m. And at first we were at a three hour meeting and <laughs> we've now got commitment from all the land board members that we will be there four hours uh, because we wanna ensure that we have public comment and that public comment comes in early um, into the conversation. Um, so we'll be doing that. We also want to recognize all of your contributions. Um, and we have a, a special presentation we'd like to do for the governor as this will be her last land board meeting um, as she her service to the state as governor is coming to an end. So I really want to encourage you uh, to join us in person for the uh, land board meeting and your suggestion, Keith, as always, was an excellent one. Thanks, Vicki. Um, Bob? 
Yeah, no, I appreciate your suggestion too, Keith. I, I don't know that we're going to be there this time. Uh, that's not to raise undue concerns, but um, I think just speaking for Portland Audubon, um, we're happy to have a discussion around that. It's probably better a few weeks out when um, we have more clarity on some of the issues that we were talking about earlier. Uh, but I also see this one as an interim meeting, you know, because the final plan is going to be approved in um, what July and uh, I'm kind of approaching this meeting as a work in progress, and I think we may have some different issues about uh, where things need to be sped up or slowed down or, or fixed or changed. So um, I'm kind of approaching it more from that angle and, and less from a, a need to necessarily have kind of a unified statement at this point. But again, open to discussion here. Thanks for the perspective, Bob. Anyone else before we move forward, we can revisit the topic. All right. Financials. So uh, Jeff and Shannon, I believe you're up. I think so. Um, and and I'll I'll kick it off and then Shannon will follow me. Um, and by the way, I Bob mentioned an errata sheet that's associated with the HCP, and we are working on that to put out um, here within days, not weeks. So um, it is it is a work in progress. Um, on the financial side, um, just a, a, a brief check in over the next five or ten minutes from Shannon and I to kind of give you an update on the process and and set the. Um, set the stage so that you maybe feel a little more grounded as you look at the report that we sent you late last week. Um, Senate Bill 1546 sets a number of preconditions that have to be met before the authority comes into being and on January 1st, 2024. All of you probably remember that discussion well. One of those preconditions was um, set the expectation that DSL would contract for an independent financial assessment of a financial plan that would be submitted by OSU. Um, and that assessment was intended to advise whether there's reasonable assurance provided by the plan that the research forest can be financially self-supporting year in and year out on anticipated harvest. Um, so OSU submitted uh, their financial plan on June 1st. Um, we contracted with uh, Daniel Newton um, to conduct that assessment that the statute called for. Dan has um, extensive experience overseeing forest operations in Southwest Oregon and on Oregon coastal forests and Washington coastal forests and conducting operational plans, I think, for forests based on revenue forecasting that's part of the, the management regime for the forest that he was involved in throughout his career. Um, for his assessment, Dan used all of the information provided in the OSU plan and then he did a deep dive into the revenue model that was done in 2020 that was the underpinning for the plan. Um, he finished his report in draft form in September. Um, we went through some meetings with OSU to let them review it and their modeling team to meet with Dan to resolve some questions. And then he finalized the report in October. That's the report that we provided to you under a cover email last week. Um, it's also published now on our website and available to the public as part of the meeting materials for today. Um, and that, that report identified four main conclusions that have potential implications for annual net revenue from harvest. In other words, the amount of money that's left over after all of the, um, the costs that are associated with undertaking the harvest, that would be net revenue. Um, and that would be available for other operational activities or research or whatever that goes into managing the forest. So um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on the details of those four main conclusions, but um, except to say that if you look at the report that we sent to you, um, there's a summary of those conclusions in the first three pages that's pretty straightforward and I encourage you to review it. And if you've got questions um, after, at any point, um, we're happy to talk more with you individually or, or set up a, a group um, to talk through that. Um, what I want to go, what I want to talk about is um, what we've done in response to Dan's report. And, and, and one of the things that was done was OSU did a sensitivity analysis to see what the revenue implications would be 
if all of his recommendations were incorporated into their financial plan. And that was really an important piece of work and we've spent a lot of time talking about it. Um, there were some significant downside downward revenue implications when the Newton report recommendations were inserted into the existing modeling that was done. And, um, and so in response to the report and all the follow-up discussions, um, OSU is now working on an updated assumptions for that 2020 model, um, essentially updating that model to reflect what we know today based on the work of the last two years and the forest management plan and, and a lot of different things, uh, as well as to change some of the key assumptions that were embedded in that 2020 model um, that might not be accurately as accurate today as we thought maybe they would be back when the model was done and having some impact, we think, on the revenue results that we're seeing um, from incorporating Dan's report. So um, we're all expecting that um, that other model run will be done to incorporate those updated assumptions. And then OSU, is, as they're doing that, their team's also going to work with us and Dan to make sure that the findings of his report are transparent and that, and, and essentially right now, um, DSL, we're, we're going to wait for that work to be done this winter before making the financial viability certification that's required by Senate Bill 1546. Um, I think we've got, we've moved from having a plan and a report to kind of having a collaboration on what we do to make sure that we have the most accurate set of information and data that we can in order to make the forecast on, on um, what, what should be the basis for a baseline budget. Um, and, and I think that's a really good place for us to be right now. Um, and so that I'm gonna stop there, let Shannon provide any context that maybe she wants to or Tom um, on behalf of OSU, and then we can answer questions or talk a little bit more about what you want to talk about. Thanks, Jeff. And, and I'll turn it over to Tom as well if he has anything to add. But I just wanted to um, to echo that, you know, this this next stage that we're at right now um, really is a, a collaborative step in the process. And it's what a lot of um, the data collection and analysis and work on these sections of the forest management plan has been leading up to. And so um, what we're looking at right now is, is doing that updated analysis um, with the information that we have today um, for what a realistic expectation is for the forest and, and bracketing that so that we understand what the range is, um, how different variables um, will contribute to um, to what we, we might see um, with, with this plan. Um, for the forest. And that includes um, feedback that we've gotten from members of this advisory committee. Um, it includes recommendations from Dan Newton's report, um, as well as, as I said, um, some assumptions that we would like to adjust with what we know now from the forest management planning process. So that's something that we're gonna be um, working on together. Tom, did you have anything that you wanted to add to that? Uh I think you pretty much nailed it, uh, Shannon. I would just say that, you know, um, we really appreciate both the analysis that was done by Dan, as well as the input from several of the stakeholder, you know, advisory committee members that, you know, uh, have identified, had identified and, and you know, suspected that the re revenue, um, uh, that the revenue, projections may have been high. And so we want to get this right because we don't want to run into this game with this notion of uh, revenue being something that it can't be. We, we would much rather be conservative in that regard if the numbers show that as such. But we do feel really strongly that there are some assumptions that need to be tested as well as um, uh, using the up-to-date uh, data as well as the you know uh, updated uh, stand allocations to rerun those numbers get uh, a uh, sensible projection bracketed as uh, Shannon said to uh, make sure that we're op operating within uh, that we will be operating within our means in terms of what the forest can generate and importantly 
you know, the, the budget was built around uh, and um, a estimate that was generated on, you know, the 2020 model that was done by a third party, uh, Mason, Bruce, and Gerard, along with John Sessions, who's within the college. Um, and, uh, uh, but uh, was a best guess at the, uh, you know, estimate at the time, but uh, with additional uh, input and uh, 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 and updated data, we we will you know rerun those uh, analyses and hopefully come up with a uh, a range that we can safely operate within. The other piece of it that hasn't been discussed at all is the the um, costs, the expenditures for the research forest. This is a research forest. It's not an industrial operation. And it's really different in that regard. And uh, the costs still need to be evaluated as part of the whole financial plan. But of course, that has to be based on reasonable revenue projections. So that was a really sensible place to start, but the analysis isn't done. We need to go through in detail the cost structure as well as, you know, what are, what's a re within that revenue projection, what's a reasonable way to operate that forest in a way that will get us to where we want to be or need to be. If this is going to be a, you know, uh, internationally uh, impactful uh, and regionally impactful research forest, we identified a whole host of, of response variables and and in terms of you know what we'll be measuring with uh, uh, the triad design as well as all these nested experiments, and we would have to scale that back under a scenario of uh, lower revenue projections, and that would be part of uh, the next stage of that effort is coming up with those you know evaluating the. Um, the cost structure for the research in addition to uh, the costs associated with the management, which was already partially done uh, through the Newton report. So just wanted to emphasize, we do have more work to do on a, on a full financial analysis uh, uh, before we make any, you know, uh, final uh, assessments on that. Thing. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate it. Um, Jeff, did you have one more thing? And then, and then yeah, I'll... I I think what I I didn't mean to uh, imply, and I'm really glad that Shannon and Tom said this. We relied a lot on on some advisory committee member input here, and and the expertise that Paul and Colin and Keith in particular brought to the table. Even though we didn't have an official working group on this, we we have consulted and will continue to throughout this until we get to the end point. So it isn't a silo that's happening here. We we actually um, are using the the expertise we've got on this committee quite a bit. Just want to make sure everybody knows that. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Paul. Yeah, um, Shannon, you use the term not um, the a realistic expectation on the on the financial and 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 Tom, you you used. Um, a financial plan that we could safely operate within, and I, I would, I would take exception to both of those. Um, and, and I've been, I've been saying this: um, we need a financial plan that plans for the absolute worst-case scenario. You know, OSU decided that they didn't want to own this forest. That it was going to be this this new entity that is responsible for managing this forest, and and they they need to be assured that that it will work. So I'm I'm taking a stance that you need to go back and not do the not redo the finances um, of what the forest will generate. You need to redo what a bare bones minimum research forest will cost. Um, you don't need to take a, a fillet knife to it or a scalpel. You need to take a meat cleaver to it and cut it down to the absolute bare minimum. Okay, so 
there probably is going to be more money than the bare minimum. Probably. Can't plan for it, but there probably will be. That money is absolutely dedicated to the research. So if that money is available, then OSU needs to be able to come back to the authority and ask for that money to do, to do the, the really cool stuff that, that we want to do out there. But, but you need to build um, a plan that, that does the absolute minimum. And if there's money left over, then you can do you can do all the other special stuff. But you need to you need to incorporate the the monitoring that you have to do, um, and you need to plan just for the minimum the three species: coho, murrelet, and and the owl. So, um, I, I and I've said this to a couple of you. I really don't care what the financial projections are for, for reasonable or, or safely, um, I want a bare minimum budget that we can operate in and we can guarantee that we'll be able to operate um, well into the future. So that's that's where I am. And you know, you know Paul, can I, can I, if I can respond to that, Peter, is that all? Um, Paul, I appreciate that perspective. And I think, you know, I, I think your, your point is really well taken. What, what's the, you know, we cannot afford to get out with an operation that absolutely can't pay for itself based on the, the revenue, you know, that is actually generated on the forest. Um, uh, so I, I appreciate that, that thought and input. With regard to the absolute worst case scenario, that's zero revenue. And that's what's happening right now. And that's what we, this committee worked together to try to craft that we would avoid, that we would be able to create a proposal for a forest that had the buy-in from all different aspects, from environmental NGOs, from the local uh, recreation objectives, from timber management, from interests, from uh, county commissioners, and that's how we built a proposal was to to try to get around the litigation that occurred on the forest previously. That you know when it was a, uh, a state forest, and provide the opportunity to conduct this research that we all have agreed needs to be done to advance forestry as the most in the most sustainable and um and uh you know when i say sustainable i mean both financially as well as ecologically socially and and so if we did take the worst case scenario that would that would be to say that we would have absolutely no revenue. And obviously that's not what you mean. We did create a bare minimum budget when we did the original evaluation of the forest uh, for the research proposal, we created a, this is the bare minimum and we created, a. Uh, you remember we talked about it as a Cadillac model and the, I don't remember the Pinto or the, the exploding Pinto or something. But anyhow, we, we did that and we can redo that. And we can try to end, you know, we can come to an agreement as a group about here's the bare minimum that would need to be done. As you said, the HCP monitoring absolutely has to be done. But some of these other things that we've written into it currently based on a $5.6 million revenue net revenue stream is not realistic and that needs to be scaled back. And that's part of that next step in the financial assessment. So uh, from the both the revenue stream side, but also in the management and research cost side. Paul, thanks, thanks Tom. Yeah, um, zero is, 
zero is 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 not where we're going. Um, what I'm what I'm saying is that it it every every choice um, in the management, if if you've got a range, you pick the lowest. Um, you pick the lowest market. You pick the highest the highest cost. Um, that's what I'm talking about. But but regardless of that, um, let's come up with a with a proposal, um, a plan that that we know we can fund, that we absolutely know that we'll we'll have success on that little piece of it. And then going forward, working with with this new authority, um, you will build a a, Roma, a more robust research um, plan. Um, but to start with just the very basics. And I, I think we're on the same page. Nobody wants to go to zero. Well, I don't think anybody wants to go to zero at this point, I hope. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate the discussion. Um, any Anything else on this topic? Otherwise, we'll take a short break and then come back and the next topic um why don't we say let's take five minutes and then uh in five minutes from your clock of reference we'll um go into a conversation about the upcoming land board meeting and preparation therefore all right remember if you've got your camera on you've got your camera on
sorry for the short break, folks. As we said at the outset, lots to cover today. So if you're in a position to come back and allow us to get started, we'll we'll go ahead and move to the next section. All right, looks like folks are coming back here. So Vicki, when you're ready, you can go ahead and get started. Okay, great. I'm gonna have um, Jeff uh, share his screen um, <clears throat> so we can go through um, a slide. Um, this is the anticipated land board items in December. As I mentioned, we're going to start at nine which is the land board award presentation. If y'all missed it, uh, the Elliott State Research Forest Advisory Committee received the partnership award uh, by the land board. And so we'll do a presentation at nine. And then at 9.30, we will start in on the Elliott agenda items. We'll have um, public comment. As I mentioned, we wanted to do that early on in the engagement process. Um, then we'll discuss the forest management plan that you've heard about today. We'll move on into decoupling, decoupling the forest from the common school fund, uh, delineating the boundaries of the research forest, and then we'll talk about prospective board appointments. That is the full three hours, um, and I expect it will take that long. Then at 1230, we'll have other agenda items. I've tried to keep the agenda pretty clear uh, from things that we absolutely do not need to do in December, but there are a couple of items that we'll be putting on there and um, should only take about a half an hour at the most. So um, I think that was the only slide we had to share, right, Jeff? Yes, I okay. think that's right. You can un unshare and then I'll talk about the other things that we have. So let me talk a little bit about the um, prospective appointments to the research authority. Um, I want to provide you with some more details on that. As you know, from the email I sent a few weeks ago, uh, we, DSL, plan to close out the work of this advisory committee um, in December. We've kept you far too long and we've appreciated all your work, but it's, it's time to let you get back to your other business um, and or move forward. So we'll talk about that. Um, I'm recommending to the land board that anyone um, who's currently serving on this advisory committee and wishes to be appointed to the authority be considered by the land board um, to be appointed to that authority. For me and my team, um, we have just felt that your input has been invaluable, 45 months of input. Um, there's a lot of brain power in this advisory committee. So if you'd like to continue on to the authority, we're making that recommendation. And while I, this is really an important piece, the appointments that the land board would provide in December are not to take place until they won't be effective until January 1 of 2024. So again, you would be operating in an advisory committee capacity, um, but that means that you're, you're operating more as a potential board member that will become effective in January. Uh, we're gonna need that help. Um, I will also tell you that we have recommended on our list um, that Ryan Singleton and our staff, our, st our forester, be appointed to one of the one-year slots there are a number, there's like two one-year spots and some other two-year and four-year spots. Um, so we have asked um, that Ryan be appointed to one of those to help provide that transition as we decouple the forest and move into um, the research forest. It's really um, important to note that um, we are following the terms of Senate Bill 1546, which establishes the new authority and specifically addresses the process for appointing the first board members. We asked Peter, 
we always ask Peter to do things. He took this job on and I'm not sure he knew how much work it was. Maybe so, but um, your skill is always appreciated, Peter. But we asked Peter to help all of you on this committee to develop your list of candidates. We asked OSU for their list and we um, developed our list internally here at the department. All three of those lists, none of them will be shaved, all three of those lists will be provided to the land board members and their assistants later this week. We anticipate the land board will consider appointing some number of board members on December 13. We don't know how many. The um, authority board, according to the statute, will be seven to nine members. So you could see all seven, all nine, any iteration thereof appointed in December. It's really up to the land board to decide that. Um, before the lists are being sent to the land board members and their assistants, Jeff and I will be meeting with OSU and Peter uh, to see if there are some obvious consensus recommendations to make to the board. Um, Peter will be your proxy for that discussion because I can't have that discussion with each and every one of you. Um, so if you have strong opinions, please make sure that you communicate with him directly. And Jeff and I are also happy to talk with you um, if you'd like. At some point before the meeting in December, I expect the land board assistants will ask me to confirm that the individuals they wish to appoint are willing to serve. So um, expect to get a call from me to um, ensure that you are still interested if the land board wants me to um, follow up on that. We won't be discussing any names publicly until the land board meeting materials are published on December 6th, which um, is a week before the land board meeting as is you, our usual practice. Public testimony regarding the recommended candidates as well as the other Elliott items before the land board for consideration will of course be accepted. A written testimony, as usual, will be received by, must be received by 10 a.m. on December 12th um, so that it can be provided to the land board in advance. Spoken testimony will also be taken during the December 13 meeting, either via Zoom or in person. And as you see, the public testimony is first up on the agenda. And specific testimony information will be posted on the DSL website and sent to the Elliott mailing list as the meeting gets closer because the one thing our department really um, cares about is transparency, transparency in this process, as well as in everything we do. Um, we are, we've been in a website redesign process for about two years now, we're almost done, um, but we have done our best to make sure that everything regarding the Elliott has been posted and everyone has access to the same information um, because knowledge is power and everyone needs to have the same equal power about knowing what we're doing with the Elliot and where we're headed. So that would be my comments today. Do any of you have any questions or need any clarification on any of those items? I'm not seeing any hands. Okay, well, I, I can tell you, we do have some consensus candidates. I've seen the list um, and there are some that are not. So we'll continue to have conversations about that. And um, I just wanna value everyone who has either self-nominated themselves or been recommended by someone else because no matter how your name comes to the land board, I know they, as well as I and my team, appreciate that you have this tremendous interest in seeing this be a successful effort for Oregon. So I'll turn it back over to you, Peter, Jeff, unless you had anything I forgot. Okay, looks like we're good. Any questions about uh, run of show for the land board meeting <clears throat> or the process for nominations? Okay, um, 
Any additional thoughts about your engagement in the land board meeting itself um, from committee members? So what I would say at this point, knowing that um, there is both a desire from some and, and a recommendation for some to think about having a joint statement, also some potential questions, I think, in light of outstanding topics, that we hold that in reserve and add it to our list of topics we need to continue to work on. Maybe there's somebody that wants to start to think about what might be said. Um, Keith, I'll, looks like you've got something. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in here and, um, and, and not talking out of shop. Bob and I have been going back and forth a little bit and, um, and um, you, you know, his, and, and he can speak for himself and, and he, he, he seems to think, and I can live with this um, because um, if that maybe we're better off if we do individual statements um, rather than a, a joint statement. I like the joint statement idea, but I wanted, I didn't mean to jump in, Bob, and, and discuss, you know, and throw that out, but I wanted to say that uh, I just wanted to give uh, committee members the opportunity to think about that too, uh, what, what it might look like and, and if they could move in that direction because. Um, you know, with, with Bob's concerns, which I, I think are heartfelt and real, I, I, I certainly don't want to, I don't want to, I, I don't want to lean on Portland Audubon too much to sign a letter. That, and, and, but I, I also don't want to include a letter, a joint letter that leaves off Portland Audubon because they've been such a critical part to what we've done. So, um, and, and Bob can speak more eloquently than I hear. But I, I wanted to allow people to chew on that for a second too. So thanks, Bob, for for the, the back and forth we had, and and um, and thanks for considering. Thanks, Keith. And may um, where do we go, Paul? Then Bob. I, I I'm I'm with Bob. Um, you know, there's there's still a lot of unfinished business. Um, that needs to be done before the final, the final approval of this thing next July, I guess. Um, so, I I don't know what a what a a joint statement would would be other than you know we're we're continuing to work on it. Um, so um, there's still a lot to be done. Finances financials are are a big one. Um, the the uh, the agreement with OSU is is a big one um, that that we really can't um, right now. The OSU is negotiating with themselves on that one, um, so um, I I would hold off personally. Yeah, and I'll just jump in here for a second. You know, I said I said most of what I was thinking. I appreciate Keith's uh, follow up too. Um, you know, I'm thinking of this more just as a practical thing. The, the thing to me that is probably the most valuable in, certain, in terms of getting alignment would be if we are advancing a slate of candidates. If we agree upon that, I think that's a place where it's important for us to, to speak with one voice, and, and that would be powerful. Um, but I think on the other step, I think stuff's going to be moving up until the end. We're going to have different uh, concerns about different parts of it. Um, and so I think, you know, putting that in front of folks uh, as a work in progress um, you know, probably is going to be easier than trying to massage a, a joint letter right up until the end and probably places where people are going to want to emphasize some things separately anyways. So to me, it's kind of a more of a practical thing in, in this case. I mean, hopefully in July, um, I guess the expectation and hope would be that we can, we can at that point speak with one voice and say, you know, we got the FMP done. We all agree that it's satisfactory. HCP has gone through and so on. That to me is really where uh, you want to get consensus again, if you can get it. Thanks, Bob. Paul and Tom. Thanks, Peter. Um, I I don't, it, it's not a big deal to me one way or the other. I'm just curious for Keith, you know, the, you know, what was the, desired um, 
intent of of doing the joint letter at this stage you know as as has been suggested by Paul and and Bob we have a long way to go and nobody's ever said anything but that you know we've, we've we were looking at this as the intent was for us to put out key sections uh of uh chapters of the FMP by the December board meeting and uh those were presented in brief today by Shannon and um, but obviously there's a whole lot of work that yet needs to be done to, uh, to, uh, you know, in addition to the FMP, uh, but from my perspective, and maybe this is what Keith was getting at, this is your last opportunity with the land board that you've been working with over the last two and a half, three years, uh, or three years or more, uh, to, to, um, share with them, you know, this has been, this has been an unusual process and it hasn't been easy for anybody here. And yet we have stuck with it and we have continued to work together in a collegial and positive manner on all fronts and between DSL and OSU and the stakeholder board and making a statement to the governor and to the land board could be about just sharing our appreciation for their belief in us and for the uh, our continued effort to try to make this real. And um, I I don't know. I I'm curious to hear what Keith's thinking was on it. And and it is the last opportunity to engage with Governor Brown on on this. And she um, obviously was a major player in in us moving this forward. And then also uh, Vicky. I don't. I don't know if your term ends <laughs> at the end of this, but uh, yeah, anyhow, the, the um, Keith, let us know what you were thinking. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Tom. I, I, I didn't mean to insinuate that I, that our, a, a note of joints, a, a joint letter wouldn't, wouldn't honestly take appraisal of the, of the great work we have yet to do. And we, we've done that in previous letters, speaking about uh, still a long road and, and, and lots of work to accomplish. That was part of my thought process that that would be a, a part of any letter to, to the land board. Um, but I, I, even, if, if, even if those are all individual statements, I think, Tom, your point about uh, a joint letter of, of appreciation and that mentions the historic work we've done um, and the, the land board's trust in, in this process. I think I, I can get my I can get my arms around that and and about those those two different things about individual letters or or and then a joint letter of simply telling the land board um, that we recognize the the historic accomplishments we and they have done. And, and we could even include in something like that, that we know we have a long ways to go yet. <laughs> but we, yeah, anyhow. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Tom, for asking that question. And Keith, for, and and if you weren't tracking the comments, I think both Paul and, and Bob chimed in there as well, that there may be an opportunity for a joint statement and a thank you and sort of addressing some of the work less about the work that needs to happen and more reflectively about the work that's been accomplished already um, and uh, taking the opportunity to do that in front of the land board. Um, Vicki? Uh, yeah, I just, um, I appreciated that conversation um, because I, let me tell you that I recently had a call with the governor and I thanked her for her service and, um, and you know, we served together in the legislature, so we've known each other for a very long time. And I, I said, you know, there has been some tremendous achievements in your administration that you need to walk out of this office and be proud of. Um, the Klamath Dam, the removal of the Klamath Dam and coming to agreement on that was an incredible achievement that has escaped many governors. Um, and then I said, and the private forest accord, 
um, was uh, an incredible accomplishment that um, took a, a long while, but a lot of collaboration and great work. And then I started to say something else and she said, and the Elliot. Uh, so the governor appreciates um, what you all have accomplished with the Elliot. I have to tell you, she's thrilled about an HCP finally getting out, um, passing the muster of the services and going out now through the NEPA process. But she um, counts this Elliot as an achievement. And it would be really nice um, if you all could at least comment on the fact that this has been a process that has, as Tom said, and I will agree, has not been easy. There's been some anger that crops up from time to time, even for myself. There's been um, laughter. There's been serious conversations. But oh my gosh, we have stayed at the table. And I think for the governor, what that says is that the process that the land board envisioned actually worked and Oregonians should be proud of that. And so if you want to put your letter in that way and say, yes, we still have a lot of things to do. Um, the land board could even, um, I've known them to make their votes provisional on certain achievements being uh, met. Um, so there's a lot of things that the land board can do. Um, and just hearing how you all feel about that and how you, the things that you believe are still outstanding that are important to be met, um, that would also be good to put on the record. And you can do that in individual letters or individual testimony. It really doesn't matter. But I just want you to know that I think the governor and the land board would appreciate hearing that this process actually worked. Thanks. Thanks, Vicki. Anything um, else for land board prep? Um, Keith, would you be willing to be the the first drafter of a of a draft? Thank you. Element, <laughs> if yeah, I could be so bold. No, I'll I'll be glad to do that. I'll try to get it out in in short order. And uh, if you'd allow me, I'm going to run it. Uh, I'll run it by Bob and Paul um, first, and then we'll we'll see what it sounds like to everybody else. Is that okay? Works for me. Thank you. All right. All right. Now we've got a, a round of uh, brief updates. And um, as a reminder, members of the public, if you would like to make a uh, public comment before the conclusion of the meeting, please send me a chat. Um, and I'll make sure to get you in the queue. Thanks. Um, Jeff, I think you're taking lead, but there are others that may chime in on certain facets of this um, update section. I think that's right. Mainly Paul Odenthal, I think, is on deck with me here. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to run through these quickly. Um, how long do we have? I've lost track. Uh, you've got... I can About do a, a two-minute version or a 10-minute version. What do you want? <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a, enough time for you to be able to cover them each. Um, okay. You shouldn't Great. have to skip any. Okay, then we'll pause after each one. You can see if there's any questions and we'll go forward. Um, first on the list is um, a carbon uh, market RFP. We've talked about this a couple of times. Um, at the request of the at the direction of the governor, we have been preparing a request for proposals to um, seek project manager expertise to guide a potential carbon credit sale uh, on the Elliott that would be um, and to evaluate whether that could be conducted in a manner that would be consistent with the research proposal, the HCP and uh, and the management objectives of the forest. Um, that RFP is getting close and we expect to release it next week. Um, I still don't have a final version um, to share, but um, it's working its way through legal right now. 
It's set into three phases. Um, the first is to report on the eligibility and parameters associated with registering the Elliott and either a voluntary or regulated carbon markets, evaluate both types of markets and the potential revenue from sale that could be accomplished and what the, what the parameters for enrollment would mean um, and in terms of compatibility with the HCP and the research objectives of the forest. Um, and then um, there's a, a wait and a decision made about whether to go forward. If the decision is made to go forward, there's a phase two of the RFP that would be for project management expertise to um, provide all of, of what's necessary to get through the registration and certification process and, and become ready to actually sell credits on the market that's chosen. Third phase would be to assist in the sale of the credits over time. So um, that RFP is gonna be posted. Um, it'll be accessible to any members of the public and to any firms. I know that we had some members of the public that were really interested in, in um, making sure that some entities knew that we were interested in that. And so um, I hope those folks are listening and we'll be putting out a blast in, in, on our stakeholder email blast. The notice will go out on that too. So that's the carbon piece of the update. Any questions? Yeah, Paul. It sounded like one of the options was to to get all of this in place, get the information in place, and then wait. Um, my assumption that if you sell carbons, it puts constraints of some sort on the forest. Wouldn't that be a better decision to hold off until until the authorities in place and let them make that decision? In, well, that's, go ahead with with OSU. Yeah, that is, um, that's part of why we're breaking this into three parts, um, is to make the decision about, about um, even assuming we're going to go forward, um, where does the revenue grow, go? There's, there's carbon that's been grown by the Common School Fund and the land board um, that exists on the forest today, and then there's carbon that will be grown over time based on the way the forest will be managed going forward. So there are a lot of things to talk about, um, and there's a relationship of this in some context to startup costs. So none of that has been worked out and um, it's part of why the prospective appointments to the board might be a really helpful thing to have in place also. So um, nobody's made any decisions about it um, other than it's appropriate to have more information than we have today so that there's not an anecdotal basis for, for deciding the pathway forward. I, I would offer that all of, all of what grew, whether it's carbon or timber, um, or habitat was common school um, owned um, and that there's no difference um, that you can't split out the carbon and say no that still belongs to to these folks um, so I I think that'll be a that'll be a interesting discussion to have Jeff yeah and I don't in in all honesty I don't know that um, everybody is um, too amped up about it. Um, right now, we're trying to make sure that this RFP gives us the due diligence and then and then just have the talk about it. This is related to the next, at least in some, some context, it's related to the next item on my update, unless there's more questions about the carbon. Um, and that's startup costs. Um, there's not too much new to report on this since our last meeting. Tom, um, did you have something on that? Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. So I would, I would, I was slow with the hand up, sorry, Jeff. Um, uh, and I don't want to take up too much time. I, I just don't really understand, I, I guess I don't understand the, the uh, even the statement around um, the, you know, the carbon grown uh, under the common school fund versus under, you know, after the common school fund, because of course, it all depends on your reference. If you you took the reference of the standing stock in 1964 or whatever it was, and then what was what <laughs> there was what was grown, but then there was that was what was harvested during that period and uh, and the revenue generated during that period. But more importantly, from a carbon perspective, what was lost. So it's a odd it's an odd thing to. I don't understand it, I guess, Jeff, but. It, 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 I, I, I get your point. And 
maybe I did it not with or didn't articulate it very well, but the way the carbon mark is broken out, there are um, once the credits are certified, there's a certain number of credits that are certified as of the date of right. the certification process. And then there are credits that are accumulated based on the management regime you have for the forest going forward. Yep. If, if you're not harvesting everything you're growing, then the differential can be added in successive years over time. And, and so those are two buckets of credits that are eligible for sale and treated um, as a question of, of how you're going to use those. Um, they or or was easily. it was it also to to question where that revenue would go? Did it belong with the common school fund? No, I I didn't oh. I didn't mean to interpret. It oh, correctly. okay, I just didn't that, understand. It, okay, it, it's more a, a it was more in response to um, is there some stake in the land board um, and the department having a, okay. a conversation on where the credits should go as opposed to the authority that's formed in twenty twenty four? And I think yeah, okay. it's, I think Thanks it's all of it. Thanks for that clarification. Okay. Um, startup costs, not much new to report. Um, the, the budgeting of startup costs and the source of revenue that'll go to um, the expenses that have been identified for the first three years um, is, is still a work in progress and is tied um, all together and interrelated with the, some of the conversations we had earlier in this meeting. Treasurer's office as, um, is joining in the discussions with um, the department and OSU on this. We've met once. Um, we um, will reconvene here as things sort out uh, going into the land board meeting, but there won't be any discussion or agenda item at the land board meeting around startup costs. We have the roughly three and a half million dollars in federal funds that um, came through USDA um, appropriation. Um, that is to help subsidize some of the monitoring equipment that will be part of starting up the forest. Um, thanks to work that was done um, with OSU and the lead on that. Um, DSL still working uh, with um, a, a ranking official in the Department of Interior who is, um, is, is very interested in helping. We have in the current federal appropriations process direction to the Fish and Wildlife Service to help the state of Oregon find um, funds, eligible federal funds through um, interior programs that could go towards startup of the forest. Carbon dollars um, are a potential source um, for startup costs. Um, appropriation of funds could be a, a, potential, um, a potential source of, of funds, um, but there's not any new and direct, specific direction on where we're headed with the startup costs today to bring you up to speed on behind besides that. Um, appraisal, we discussed the final appraisal last time. It's currently posted on the department's website. I don't have any new news on that topic. Um, there was um, a lawsuit pending uh, um, that didn't relate directly to this appraisal, but that lawsuit was against the department was dismissed um, at the circuit court level and then appeal was turned down by the Court of Appeals since the last time we met. So um, we don't have um, any new news on the appraisal or the litigation front around the common school fund obligations that have been raised in the past. Um, East Hackey Ridge, any questions so far? I can pause here, no hands. All right, East Hackey Ridge parcel. Um, we are preparing the land board agenda item of, um, that relates to decoupling that will also ask for this parcel to be decoupled from the common school fund. So that's what we're anticipating being part of that land board agenda item. Um, the, it's still a work in progress, whether there's gonna be action to fold in December to fold the parcel into the Elliott State Research Forest. Um, the authority exists to do that, and um, that's something we're still literally sorting out right now. Um, and um, I think that I, I would anticipate that could well be part of what's recommended at the December land board meeting to fold it into the research forest authority um, as part of the description of the lands covered, um, but we just haven't gotten there yet. So that, that's East Hackey Ridge at the moment. Hands, no hands, okay. Um, HCP, um, 
our draft HCP is in the hands of the federal agencies. It's gone through the legal sufficiency review, both in the region and most recently at, um, in Washington, DC. And their process for um, soliciting and receiving public comments on the draft HCP and the, alter the environmental impact statement and all the alternatives analysis that, they, that the federal agencies have to do, that is about to start sometime in the next couple of weeks, week or two. Um, DSL and OSU are running a public information session this Thursday. And at that session at the very beginning for about 10 minutes, there will be somebody that will be able to describe exactly what the federal process is, what the timelines will be for that federal process, and then um, they, they'll sign off. Um, but we will have a good roadmap for everyone on how you can um, provide comments to the federal agencies so that they are tailored into the response and, and, and their final decision on the HCP and the, and the environmental impact statement. Um, I guess what the bottom line on all of the HCP process is that right now we are on schedule to meet the Senate Bill 1546 timeline. Um, so that's one of those preconditions and um, we, we, are, we are on track and on schedule, which is great. I think contract terms might be yours, Paul Odenthal. It is, thanks, Jeff. Uh, so uh, contract terms, we, uh, at October meeting of our Board of Trustees, we presented uh, OSU contract terms for the future contract with the authority as well. It was, uh, it was received well by our Board of Trustees. It seemed to answer the mail and many uh, accords. Uh, areas of concern they have is how that contract will be formed in the future. Um, as uh, Paul Beck eloquently said earlier, we are negotiating with ourselves at this point. And so we know there's a long ways to go on that and the terms will have a lot of work as we move forward as well. Um, but it is a good starting place. Uh, Board of Trustees is excited and, and can see now a mechanism um, that, uh, that you know will be able to come to a contract that is a good for the forest, good for the authority, and, and good for OSU as well as we move forward. So we'll be we'll be gathering some feedback from that as well. We'll update the board in January, um, but we are looking for, as far as the uh, sunset clause related to OSU and the board of trustees, uh, April, April meeting for that as well. Keith? Yeah, hey, Paul, please, and Tom, please keep us posted on, or keep, uh, since this this advisory committee sort of drifts away in some degree, keep a management committee posted on on the, when the time is right and ripe and appropriate to to reach out to the land board. Um, I, I still think that that is that behooves us all and the process to do that. And uh, I think as well as you've you've all done from OSU to speak to the land board about what we've what what we've done, uh, I, I think it makes sense for them to hear from us as well. So if 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 that seems to be, I don't mean to be a, a, a beat a dead horse here, but if it if if it seems to be appropriate, please keep us posted. Yeah, Keith, and I think you're thinking the the board of trustees, not the land board. No, no, I I meant the board of trustees. I, okay. I, I thought okay. I'd said that might be. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, Keith, and we're looking for that. We want to have that engagement. Yeah, totally. Thanks, Keith. And then I think I've got one more item, um, and that's um, Shutter Creek. And um, so just a reminder that um, the Shutter Creek um, prison facility was closed by corrections, and the plan was for the property to revert back to the Federal General Services Administration to be auctioned. Um, DSL submitted an application along with um, the governor's office asking for the property to be turned over to the state instead of being put on the auction block um, and utilizing a process that exists for identifying a particular public purpose that federal property surplus property can be used for to advance different um, conservation um, goals actually was the one that we, we slotted into. Um, there were a lot of different criteria that we had to meet and serve up in an application that we submitted, oof, I don't even remember how many months ago, last spring. Um, 
I have a commitment that we will be getting official word before the land board meeting, but um, this morning I got an email from GSA saying that the letter is drafted and ready for signature approving our application. So um, we will have the option of moving forward with Shutter Creek if it makes sense. And I think at the last land board meeting, we had a discussion um, where we emphasized if it makes sense, there's a number of considerations around the property that um, have to be addressed. So our application um, to the General Services Administration gives us until August of 2023 to do due diligence on the property um, and whether it will fit as the headquarters for the Elliott State Research Forest. But um, I think we're about to get through the first and, and one of the biggest gates in the process in the next couple of weeks. I think that's it for my update. I don't know if Vicki had any additions, um, but I think I'm good. Um, Jeff, I think, didn't we have a federal appropriation to do some demolition on the Shutter Creek property? Yeah, thank you. We do have in the current GSA budget um, $4 million to help um, retrofit and do demo on the property to kind of make it much more financially viable. Um, so that's not the entirety of what we would need to do to have the facilities be the right facilities to run the research forest and not be a financial burden on the budget of the forest, but it's... Um, a really good start to get rid of some of the problems that are on the current site that are historically there because of um, outdated um, past end of life kind of facilities. There's 30 some buildings on the site that need to be generally torn down and, and, um, and eliminated in order to have it be a financially viable proposition. Thanks, Vicki. Uh, yeah, and that's partly, uh... There aren't very many of, I don't think there's one building that's ADA accessible on my tour. Um, and in fact, the newer part, the dormitories weren't even ADA accessible because you had to go up and down stairs. Um, and that was after my knee surgery and it was almost impossible to do. So the, the site is aged um, and it really needs some work. Um, I would also say that uh, we have been working with the CT Clutzi tribe about their interest in um, either partnering or um, uh, taking some space on that site for their natural resources department. Um, so all those conversations are continuing. The first piece was just to get a letter from GSA saying, yes, <laughs> you have until next August to decide what to do. And so um, there's still a lot of work yet to be done on that, but um, uh, I wanna thank Senator Merkley um, and his staff. I believe they're the ones who helped us give, get the 4 million. Um, so we are working closely with our um, congressional staff. Thanks, Vicki. Thanks, Jeff. Um, Paul? I, I think one thing that might help is if we stop calling it a former prison and, and call it um, a former radar installation, which is what it was. <laughs> um, it's a it's a beautiful site. I mean, it once is. you get beyond the fact that there there is a um, a prison or was a prison on on one portion of it, that 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 piece of real estate is absolutely beautiful. I mean, you can see. 30 miles of coastline from up there. So I'm excited. I hope I hope it works out. Um, I think it will. Uh, it just seems like the perfect location to me. Yeah, it seems a little incongruous that there was a prison there so that the inmates could enjoy the view. <laughs> it's it's um, an absolutely incredible view. Um, and um, Chief Slider of the CT Clutzi says that he can feel his people there. And I don't doubt him for a minute. It's it's an incredible place. Good. 
All right. Thanks for that up, uh, set of updates. Anything else on public uh, engagement? That was the last topic on your list. You you touched on it in particular related both the H HCP as well as um, the upcoming public listening session on the 17th. But I just want to double check there, Jeff. Anything else? Um, I just want to make sure I get the time right. So the, um, the public listening session is this week um, at... 6 p.m., um, 6 to 8 p.m., um, or 7.30, I think it's a two-hour public listening session. It's being hosted by Oregon State University, primarily associated with the forest management plan and to take um, any questions and, and, um, and have discussion on, on about the forest management plan. Um, and once that is done, then we'll do the follow-up on any of the agenda items that were on the table today, and um, DSL will be ready to answer questions or have a discussion with folks that have um, things to, thoughts to offer and questions to ask about, about any of the topics we talked about here today. Um, and then briefly at the very beginning of that session, we'll just have five minutes or 10 minutes to describe what the public process is that the federal agencies will run on the HCP. Thanks. And if you need it, um, Molly posted time and, and uh, date in the chat in case you missed it. Um, it's also on the websites for both OSU and DSL, I imagine. Shannon? I also just wanted to add, um, in addition to the listening session, we do still um, have the opportunity for public input and feedback um, with written comments at the elliot.research at oregonstate.edu email address. Um, so Molly, if you could also add that to the chat. Um, that's on OSU's webpage about the Elliot and is also linked with um, with DSL's webpage. So if anyone has um, written comments that they'd like to submit at any time, please feel free to do that as well. Thank you. And we are doing a tag team here because that reminds me just one more time, Vicki mentioned it, at land board meetings, there is a process to sign up for, um, to be able to um, provide spoken testimony at the land board meeting and that's posted that'll all that kind of direction and material is posted for um, folks that want to participate in the land board meeting on December 13th, along with the deadline for submittal of any written testimony that you want to make sure is in front of the board. Great. All right, I have. Um... Barb and then Peggy for public comment. So Barb, do you want to go first for brief public comment? Hi, sure. Can you hear me? Yep, we got you, Barb. Hi. You got you. Okay, fine. So I'm trying I'm, this is like one of my first uh, Zoom meetings ever. I just want to thank you guys. You're amazing and um, really congratulate you on the evolution of your thinking and and going forward with protection of the old growth. I'm totally grateful. Um, I just want to reiterate uh, and regurgitate uh, for 15 years, Not, cut nothing over 65 years old, no poisonous phenoxy herbicide sprays. And, um, you know, climate change is upon us. In Florida, two, two, two degrees hotter ocean on the Gulf side, two degrees hotter ocean on the, on the East Coast. And we have property and family on both sides, and they are really feeling it, the, uh, the carbon, uh, imbalance the uh the uh the climate devastation uh and it's because of fossil fuel and lack of forest so we've deforested the planet by 50 percent and we just can't do it anymore so we're just not gonna the oregonians because we have something to say here we're not going to allow any any trees hopefully cut over 65 years old no ITPs, no law, you know, it, like Bob Dylan said, it, at the times they are a changing. I want to nominate uh, Francis Etherington and Bob Salinger for the continuation of the uh, Department of State Lands. I want to thank Governor Brown. She's been amazing. Vicki Walker, uh, Jeff, and Allie Hansen. Hammer it, you guys. You're doing great. Go for NOAA. Go for federal funding. Go for uh, Biden's whatever money they've got to offset your financial whatevers and good job and congratulations and thank you. Good work, so, so grateful, so grateful. And I'm so sorry you couldn't join me here today on the West Fork, it is, it is just frigging gorgeous. Sunny day, water's clear after a big rain and uh, 
man, is it gorgeous. But there's no fish and there's no owls. Okay, carry on. Thank you. Thanks, Barb. Soak it up. Yep. Um, yep. Any, yeah, you're all welcome. Anytime you want to visit, this property is open to you for use or visitation or uh, whatever you need. Uh, we're here for you. I want you to succeed and thank you. Okay. Thanks, Barb. Um, Peggy. All right. Francis. All right. <laughs> well, I know it's a hard, that's a hard act to follow. Um, Peggy Lynch, League of Women Voters of Oregon. Um, I want to thank, first of all, thank all of you for the work that you have done. Your diverse perspectives mm. have certainly been helpful in moving us forward. Um, I checked my files and my first file about the Elliotists for 2009, but certainly by 2015, the League has been involved in uh, conversations around the Elliot and how to make it uh, the best place uh, for Oregonians forever. So you'll be surprised that I don't have an answer but I have a comment and a question. Uh, and I thank Paul Beck for his comments because that's where I wanna go, is that we continue to be concerned about the financials. We want success and that's the goal. And uh, I just read the financials and on page 11 of the document that was provided in the materials, uh, it says that the modified modeled results upon which OSU for financial plan is based are in the neighborhood of 20% too high. And so with those concerns, I hope that you will find answers to make sure that this is a financially viable product, particularly as you link the forest management plan to the financials. Um, and the last thing I want to say is I'm excited about the Shutter Creek. I do want to keep reminding you all that Lakeside, the city of Lakeside, really cares about whether or not that is a facility because they want somebody to help pay their sewer bills. <laughs> so, uh, so that is really important. Thank you all for all the work you do, and we will continue to follow till the very end. Thanks. Thank you, Buggy. Uh, Francis. Hi. Um, thanks for everything and all your work. And I um, and Molly uh, put something in the chat that says that we can submit written comments to this email address by the end of today. Really? We can't submit written comments after the end of today? Or would it just go to a different email address? Shannon, do you want to address that? I think there was a clarification. Yeah, thanks for that question, Francis. I think Molly, just as you were talking, um, put a clarification in the in the meeting chat. Um, with the timeline for materials to submit to the land board, um, the deadline for, for written comments is today for that. But um, on moving forward, there's, there's an open window um, for continual comments that will be incorporated into um, additional drafts. So today is definitely not the last opportunity for those written comments. Um, it's just based on our timeline for when we need to send documents to the land board and incorporate those comments. Um, we need to do that um, today. Hopefully that helps clarify. Okay, so the, the email address will be the same moving forward for, for any future comments as well. Okay, thanks for that clarification. And, you know, just a little comment on Shutter Creek. I think that you should uh, set aside part of it as a public park so that we can all see that view. <laughs> just still Thanks, comment. Francis. <laughs> all right. Um, thanks to the members of the public for joining and for your comments, and thanks to the committee members um, for your presence today, for your ongoing support of the effort, to OSU um, and the team, Shannon, Katie, Deanne, Jen, Tom, and others who have put so much time and energy into the FMP uh, in particular. Um, <clears throat> we appreciate you know that there's more there are more miles to travel um but many miles have already been traveled so thank you for the work you've put into this keith um as we conclude here do you, final thought there yeah two two final thoughts uh, i'll just i'll just do one and, and you can do uh, two um okay i'll do two and 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 i'm i'm i this one i i, I felt that somehow it 
Is is Bob still with us? Bob, you still here? Ah, dang it, I don't see him. Anyway, uh, over I, I was a, a week ago, I was speaking in in uh, Newport a week ago Saturday at a, at the State of the State conference, and and uh, Melissa Cribbins was uh, emceeing a panel I was on, and she she showed me, and you guys should go look at us. We immediately laughed because it reminds us so much of Bob, and and I'll I'll share this with him. Uh, she told me the story that there's this website out there and, and this called birdsaren'treal.com. Have you guys seen that? So, in, and here's the story. In 2017, this, as a spoof, uh, this guy marched in a, a march in Washington, D.C. with a sign that said, birds aren't real. And then he got such a, a feedback on it, he created this false conspiracy that all the birds in the United States were killed in night between 1958 and 1971. And they're all, uh, they're all now drones uh, by the, that spy on you for the federal government. It's absolutely hilarious. You can get, they, they've got a merchandise page where you can go buy shirts and sweatshirts that say birds aren't real. And if it flies, it spies is their, uh, is their slogan. So if you haven't seen it, you go see it. And somehow I'm going to buy a coffee cup. But he's not here. So you won't be surprised. I'm buying a coffee cup for Bob that says birds aren't real on it. So uh, it's, uh, I, I was hoping he'd still be here. And on that, I, I, since I mentioned Melissa, uh, as it appears right now, I mean, I've sat in this room with you guys for 45 months and filled with brilliant people. And that's been one of the great joys uh, as a part of this. But I, as often as not, the one who I've felt the most brilliant in the room was Melissa. Uh, she's been a tremendous county commissioner. And I know that uh, looking at the very late results, uh, she was up for re-election in her, her bid in Coos County and uh, was defeated by out of 29,000 votes uh, by about 160 votes, 0.6%. And um, it'll, and in my my personal opinion, I'm not, I don't live in Coos County and, and Melissa and I are, are registered to different parties, but it'll be a tremendous loss to the coast and and to, especially to Coos County too. She's, so um, I, I, that was just for your, I didn't know if folks were aware and and I wanted to bring that up and, and I'm, I'm sorry that she's not here. So, um, Anyway, those are the two things. Uh, and, and if I bring it, if I bring a coffee cup someday for Bob, know where it came from. So, thanks, Keith, for both both facets there, Paul. Um, yeah, I, I echo your your comments about Melissa. That's a that's a big loss as far as I'm concerned. Um, your your birds aren't real. Um, that that is a whole political platform. You didn't know that. Yeah, I, I, first I'd heard of it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think there were people running on that this year. <laughs> with with that, I'll I'll say goodbye. Yeah, yeah. With that, we will we will uh, keep in touch um, as we get to the land board, closer to the land board meeting. Make you know that you'll receive materials and whatnot in advance. Um, and additional information. Um, as Vicki said at the outset, if you're able to, we'd sure uh, appreciate your attendance there. Um, and uh, thanks again for all the hard work. Have a great rest of your afternoon.